Good to be with you again. I, uh, this is a bit of a double-edged sword in one sense, trying to tackle this sort of issue in 20 minutes is uh, like trying to gargle peanut butter. But on the other hand, if I've only been given 20 minutes, I can't screw it up that badly. So uh, in any case, I shall press on. I got to find Richard, though, because once he starts moving, then I know I, I need to start wrapping it up. <laughs> um, <laughs> in any case, so what I want to do, given the, the time constraints, is just make a few general points and then recommend a book, but I said and then, I'm not going to go in that order, I'll mention the book first. <laughs> there's, a, there's a book that you can acquire, hopefully, it might be floating around the interwebs, but I don't know anything about that, uh, that treats this issue in much more uh, detail and uh, does, I think, a rather thorough job and uh, has much worth thinking about and worth considering. And the title of that book is, Is God a Moral Monster? Making Sense of the Old Testament God. At least I think that's the subtitle. Uh, this is by a philosopher named Paul Copan. And though he's a philosopher, he also takes the Bible quite seriously, and he's done a lot of work and scholarship on this. So I commend that to you for your reading. If you want a fuller treatment of the points that I'm going to, to make here in this very brief time. What should we keep in mind? I think one of the things we need to keep in mind is that we have to realize that there is a distinction between what is descriptive in Scripture, that's hard to say, descriptive in Scripture, and what is prescriptive in Scripture, also hard to say, prescriptive in Scripture. <laughs> Now, what I mean by this is that Scripture records a lot of behavior that is rather unseemly, and I would argue rather immoral. And the mere fact that it records this behavior, whether it's on the part of otherwise godly people like David or Abraham or Noah or whomever it might be, the mere fact that it records instances of certain kinds of behavior does not give us any indication that it is prescribing that sort of behavior. It's not approving of a particular behavior merely because it might record someone engaging in that sort of behavior. Now, why is that important? Often in the Old Testament, one finds, for example, discussions of slavery and polygamy, and um, various other unseemly sorts of practices. And sometimes one will find critics that will seize on this material and say, look, God is endorsing slavery. And unfortunately, in the history of the United States, where I come from, and in the history of some other countries, perhaps, some... Uh, unscrupulous individuals get a hold of this scriptural material and systematically confuse the distinction between a description and a prescription merely because the Bible describes the institution of slavery and stipulates regulations for people who own slaves and stipulates how it is that one is to treat slaves, if one happens to own them, they confuse this with an endorsement of slavery on the part of the Bible. But the Bible nowhere endorses slavery. And arguably, in the New Testament, it lays the foundation for the eventual elimination of slavery in the uh, prohibition against kidnapping, which I think you'll find in 1 Timothy chapter 1, if memory serves. So it's important to keep in mind that whether the issue is slavery or polygamy or something else, the mere fact that the Bible describes a certain kind of behavior does not by itself show us that the authors of Scripture are endorsing that sort of behavior. It's very important 
that we keep that in mind. Related to this is the point that God has revealed himself and his character progressively throughout history. We read in Hebrews chapter 1 that though in past times God revealed himself through the prophets, he has in these last days revealed himself through his Son, who is the exact representation of the nature or the substance of the Father. If you want the full picture of who, well, see, I, I never can figure this out. This is back to me not being able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Sorry about that. Uh, if you want the full picture of who God is, you have to look at Jesus. He is the fullest and the final revelation of God. How does this relate to the Old Testament? Well, you'll remember from Deuteronomy chapter 24, I believe it is, in the first verse, we have a discussion of divorce. And the procedures that one must go through in order to obtain a divorce. And yet in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus, in his discussion of divorce, cites Genesis chapter 2 and says that the original creation story gives us the ideal that God has for us in terms of marriage, that a man is to leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And he uses that as an argument against the permissibility of divorce. And he says that Moses permitted divorce because of the hardness of people's heart to permit things. Because of the hardness of the hearts in those days, his ideal was something else. And his ideal came to fruition in the revelation of Jesus Christ who pointed back to the creation story and the original characterization of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2, verses uh, 20, I believe, and following. So what this shows is that the mere fact that God might have allowed something or might have stipulated something even in the Old Testament, it does not follow merely from that fact that God endorses that behavior today or that that is what God would hold out for us as the ideal. He revealed things progressively to human beings and to the Jews specifically. And this is relevant for when we encounter certain things in the Old Testament that Jesus either abrogates or expands upon or um, gives a new and deeper interpretation in the New Testament. And it is his words that we need to be held to and that we need to take as expressing the full character of God. And so it's important that we not forget this, that just because we find something regulated or stipulated even in the Old Testament, it doesn't follow just from that that this reflects God's character, his ideals, his preferences. Thirdly, we should bear in mind that God is the author of life, and since he has given life to everything that has it, he has the right to take it for whatever reason. And this isn't just a slogan that we will mouth when we don't know what else to say. If I were to give you, I don't know what an appropriate amount of rand would be so that it would be appreciable, but assume that I gave you, let's say, a thousand rand every day, and I did this for a year, and it was never disclosed to you exactly why I was doing this, but you came to get used to it, you came to expect it, you came to spend it regularly, factoring in the thought that I was going to continue giving this to you, 
And then suppose one day I stop and I don't give you another thousand rand one day. Seems to me that if you come to me and complain and say, why aren't you giving me the thousand rand today like you had been doing, you wouldn't have much of a leg to stand on. I just wanted to use the phrase leg to stand on. <laughs> I actually have two, but not to stand on. Uh, I wonder, what do you do with them then? Uh, so do you see the point? Because the thousand rand each day was a gift and was something to which you had no right, you don't have any right to continue to expect it. And if I should choose to withhold it one day, you don't have any right to criticize me. You didn't deserve it in the first place. It was a gift of grace, and you're not entitled to it continuing. And I think our lives are like that. God gives us life every second that we have it, every moment that we have it. And because he's done this and he continues to do it, we sometimes come to expect that he'll continue to do so. And then one day we know that he'll stop, at least in terms of our earthly life. We'll know that the gift that he had been giving us, he'll one day withhold that gift. And we don't have the right to go to him and to complain about why he's withholding the gift any more than you have the right to go to me and complain. If I had been so generous, I hope to one day become the sort of person who can be that generous. Uh, I would be tempted to spend it all on the biltong, but I, I promise I will try not to do that. But you don't have any more right to come to God and say, why aren't you continuing to give these people life as you had been doing? God can have his own reasons. He can have any reasons he wants. He said, well, I was the one giving you life in the first place. If I'm withholding life from someone at any point, this isn't immoral. It's not inappropriate. It's not something, it's not an injustice. It's not anything that anyone has any right to complain about. So, how does that relate to the Old Testament? In various passages in the Old Testament, we find references to God, apparently, at least at face value, wiping out entire people groups. Various passages that say God told the Israelites not to leave anything alive. People get rather upset about this. But I think they forget that it's God they're dealing with here. And that because he's the one giving everything that has life, life, he has the right, for whatever reason he wants, to withhold it whenever he wants. And we have no just complaints against him any more than someone can complain to someone else who had been giving them a gift each day for why they've withheld the gift all of the sudden. Well, if it really was a gift and they really weren't entitled to it in the first place, they're not entitled to keep receiving it and they have no just complaint if one day it is withheld for some reason, even if they don't know and even if they're never told what the reason is. Having said that, <laughs> There is another interpretation of those passages, one that I should quickly mention. And that is the idea that these passages that talk about God telling the Israelites to destroy everything that breathes to kill man, women, woman, woman, woman <laughs> and children, whether it's the Canaanites or the Amalekites or any other ites, There are other passages that come after this where these same people groups reemerge in the story. A good example of this is 1 Samuel chapter 15, 
where it is said that the Israelites annihilated the Amalekites. In fact, it even goes on to say <laughs> that God gets angry with Saul because he had spared the king and kept the animals. And then we continue to read in the narrative that the king is executed. But then we read later on in 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 8, that the Amalekites are still around, even though the narrative earlier had represented the situation, at least if taken literally, as though all of the Amalekites, with the exception of the king and the livestock, had been killed. We find this same sort of phenomenon with respect to, I believe it's the Jebusites and the Canaanites in Joshua chapter 10, verse 40. That after having described what seemed like the total annihilation of the Canaanites, they show up later on in the narrative. And so one way of thinking about this, and this is based on looking at common rhetoric in uh, descriptions of warfare and conquest narratives. One way to think about this is that it's a kind of hyperbole, as when I would express my hope that the lions had killed the, who was it, the crusaders? Yeah. Now, I wouldn't really express a hope that they would actually go and kill them, or that they would utterly annihilate them, or that there would be literally nothing left among the crusaders. This is understood by us to be a way of saying that I want the crusaders to be defeated by the lions. And there's some thought among various scholars that this is what's going on when we find these descriptions in the Old Testament about these people groups being utterly annihilated. It's not that God literally wanted everyone killed, including women and children, but that he wanted these people, these armies, defeated, and that this was a rhetorical way of expressing this. Now, as I say, this is just one interpretation that I think is worth exploring. Uh, this interpretation is unpacked in the book that I mentioned before by Paul Copan. Uh, there's another book that he co-authored with a fellow from New Zealand named Matthew Flanagan, uh, the title of that book is, Did God Really Command Genocide? And they expand upon their thesis in the first book to answer criticisms and respond to objections to the interpretation that I just outlined. And so I think this is worth considering. But given what I said previously about God being the author of life and having the right to take it for whatever reason he wants, I think even if the interpretation I just outlined is mistaken. And even if we have to confront the fact that God did really order the annihilation of all these people, I think even then we don't have a philosophical leg to stand on. Just wanted to use that phrase again. Even if we find that these things are an affront to our sensibilities, I think what this helps us to see, whether we think of it in this context or others, is that God is not a 21st century Western liberal. That, as C.S. Lewis had said before, Aslan is not a tame lion, but he is good. And his goodness, which can be more fully seen and the life and ministry and resurrection of Jesus assures us that in the end everyone will get what they deserve, either what they've merited through their own works or what Christ has merited for them through the cross and the resurrection. And I think this is something we need to keep in mind as well, that this earthly life is not all there is. And though we or those we care about may meet an ignominious fate in this life. I just wanted to use the word ignominious. That's, that's fun. 
ignominious. Though we or those we care about might meet an ignominious fate in this life, that's not the end of the story. And both we and anyone who turns to God in faith have the hope of the resurrection from the dead and the life of the world to come. And so we shouldn't treat this issue as though we've come into a room in the middle of a really good movie, but it happens to be on a very rather unseemly part of the movie and conclude, therefore, that the whole movie is no good. In fact, the story of the world is God's story, and it will have a good and a just ending. And with that, I'll be quiet.